Winning. Conrad from ConradRocks.net. Welcome to another edition of Coffee with Conrad. Here I am drinking coffee. I'm gonna I'm gonna mute you. So for those of the, you that don't like this slurp, it's okay. I know I can't I can't help the slurping. Hopefully everyone had a good Christmas. I was gonna say holiday, but it's Christmas. Hopefully you had a good Christmas time. I apologize for the last show's. Clipping, it's not the, uh, I had the preamp a little bit too high. Trying to do it a little bit more professional. Hopefully, eventually, I'll be able to simulcast the um, Google Hangout at the same time as Blog Talk Radio. I just don't have the equipment right now. So, hopefully, if things things pick up, I can. Now, I wanted to thank a lot of you. Uh, several of you went to my Amazon widget over the holidays and you sh- you bought going through the Amazon widget. Let me show it to you for those of you that don't know. I get a small portion of the proceeds when you do that. It's not going to make me rich, I'll tell you that, but definitely every little bit helps. Um over here on Conrad Rocks, this is for my video audience. You go down, there's that search amazon.com and you just put in some search terms. It goes to Amazon just like always. <clears throat> but um, because it come from, comes from my site, conradrocks.net, I get a small portion of the proceeds. So thank for those of you that went, thank you very much. I appreciate that. You're going to buy anyway. You like Conrad Rocks. You like Amazon. Go through my widget. So we got a lot to talk about today. I, uh, <clears throat> I was praying. <laughs> Imagine that, Conrad praying. And... I'm not really sure how we're going to do today's show, but I got lots of spiritual stuff going on, and forgive my uh, nasal thing, I got some allergies, man. I know, I don't want to speak it forth, but my gosh, you can hear it. <laughs> I, feel like I'm, I feel like I'm underwater, so I'm breathing through my mouth. Um, okay, in the news, this is probably going to lead to a teaching. But I found something interesting. Something that challenges our belief system. And we're we're rapidly approaching New Year's Day, New Year's 2014. And what do people do for New Year's? They make New Year's resolutions. <clears throat> so I'm thinking about resolutions. Thinking about my failed resolutions of the past. I used to be a member of the gym, and uh, I didn't necessarily, I used to work out like crazy. I enjoyed working out um, for a while, you know, in the gyms, and then I started not enjoying working out just for the cardio burn. I just, I, I didn't, so I started gravitating towards the fun part, like the jacuzzis and the saunas, and I loved to swim. Now, exercise was a byproduct of swimming, so I found out that if I did the things that I enjoyed and there was a byproduct of exercise, I would maintain it. And over the years, I've watched gym memberships through the gyms that I've joined. Every January, you couldn't even get on a piece of equipment because there'd be, you know, the gym would be full. There'd be three people waiting on something. You know, you couldn't even swim. You couldn't even get in a sauna, you know. So through January, you just stick it out. Halfway through January, it starts calming down. By February, it's back to normal. (laughs) The New Year's resolutions are gone. The gyms have made their money. And the people have went back to their old habits. 
So instead of so much working on my body, which that's what everyone's trying to do, when you become a Christian, we need to beat our body and keep it under subjection, of course. But our spiritual discipline, you know, the body follows the spirit. To the head of every man is Christ. And if the spirit of Christ is in us, we'll do what he asks us to do. And one of the things I like to do towards every New Year's holiday is I like to examine myself according to 2 Corinthians 13.5. Let's see if I got that up here. Here I am trying to talk about news and I get off on something first. Isn't that like me? Examine myself <clears throat> to see whether I'm in the faith. Prove my own self. Know you not myself that Jesus Christ is in me except I be reprobate. And I put myself in the in the first person there. The actual scriptures examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know you not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you except you be reprobate. You know, cast away. Rejected. If any man hath not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. So every year, just like the gym, I do a spiritual tuna. What am I going to do spiritually? Now, one of the funny aspects of this is it's not, I can't do it myself. Just like the gym, I can't. I can't make myself get on the treadmill. Oh, I can for a little bit. But have you ever noticed that after a while, if you're not putting Christ to the head of your life, your iniquity starts driving the car. You're following the flesh. You know, um, we must walk after the spirit and not after the flesh. Well, walking after the flesh means to give in to its desires, and it's real simple to do so. We're, we're doing it all the time. I mean, every second of the day, it's kind of like the spirit flesh pendulum, <laughs> you know, back and forth. Am I going to follow the spirit? Am I going to follow the flesh? So every year, I like to look backwards first off. If I don't have a major earth-shattering epiphany, spiritual revelation, one that rocks my world. I consider myself backslidden. And not, not in the traditional sense of the word where you're off in sin and you're doing all this sin and stuff. But I'm not where I could be. And I'm hearing a scripture right now, who shall ascend? <clears throat> who shall ascend the hell of the Lord? It's a psalm. I think it's Psalm 24.3. Let me look. Yeah, it's Psalm 24.3. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn, sworn deceitfully. Now notice that there's plenty of scriptures, and I read them, I, I read them over this last week about how the the heart of man's wicked, deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? And um, I read teachings from New Agers. <laughs> they did, they thought they were Christians, <laughs> but they're New Agers. Follow your heart. Follow your heart. You know, and Jesus even says the heart's wicked, desperately wicked. Out of it comes fornications, adulterers, murders, and stuff like that. But one of the things that I like to meditate on is this act of ascension. Ascending to the hill of the Lord. There is an act of where we draw closer to God, and he draws close to us. And, and you know, it's, it's really interesting. The closer we get to God, 
think of Peter. Think of all the people that get close to God. There's a twofold thing that sticks out right now in my mind. Number one, the closer you get to God, you realize, like Isaiah, oh my gosh, I am unclean. I have unclean lips. I dwell among a people of unclean lips. Peter, depart from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. Zacchaeus. He gets close and he repents. We realize at that point, as we draw close to God, that we need him. And we're scared to death. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And then through Jesus Christ, we experience forgiveness, salvation. So ascending unto the hill of the Lord. You know, I'm thinking of the new Jerusalem, which is above the earth and we need to get closer to God. We need to get closer to God. So if I don't have a major epiphany every six months or so, I judge myself to not be seeking God enough. Now, we're going to be talking a little bit this morning. I know this is heavy stuff. yoo But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking out for your souls. I'm looking out for mine, too. And what I learn, I'll pass on to you <laughs> because we're in this together, right? If I can learn from you, let me know. I mean, I want to I want to learn stuff. I'm reading all the time. So this ascension on the Lord, we examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith. So what I like to call that is brutal, brutal self-examination, brutal. I mean, you get to the point where you're ripping up, you're getting in the engine of your, your thought life. That's why I ask questions that rock. They rock. I mean, they make you quake. That's the idea. God will ask you a question. And you have to examine yourself. Wait a minute. Why do I believe what I believe? Why do I believe it? Linda had shared a, uh, a video you know, I've been hearing this from people all over the Internet that, that Jesus is just flat out going to the Muslims and showing up. You know, we're trying to bomb them from America when we should be sending missionaries with power. You know, if my preaching is in word alone without power, what good is it, you know? demonstration of power. These signs shall follow them that believe. We need to be sending those type of missionaries instead of bombs. You know, think of it this way. If you kill if you kill an unbeliever and you're the one that did it, whoa, where are they going? But if you witness to them, you've done your you've done your Ezekiel on the wall thing. You've warned them. Then you're free from that blood, just like Ezekiel is free. He told them. But if you don't tell them, the blood's on your hands. Remember that in Ezekiel, the watchman on the wall? It's a good chapter. I reflect on it often. A lot of people think, oh, well, gee, if we don't kill all the Muslims, <laughs> they're going to overtake America or something. You know, just some weird thoughts that I don't quite honestly understand. Um, but we need to realize that Christianity was built on martyrs. Oh, man, i got to read you a story later today about Watchman Nee. Man, if you've read his books. A lot of you might not know. He spent his last 20 years of his life in prison for being a Christian. I'll read a little bit about that. In a little bit, you guys remind me. It's a live show, so please remind me. It's a, it's a powerful, powerful teaching. But I, I ran across this headline today, and, it, it, and it, it challenged me to do this brutal self-examination because I already knew, I, I already knew the spirit within me resonated before I even read the article. 
Here it is. And, and it, it may not even seem compelling at first. You may go, what? What's the big deal? Well, it is a big deal. This big deal, this story will challenge your theology a little bit from an aspect you may not have thought of. Diamonds believed... <laughs> Diamonds believed to be 4.3 billion years old were actually remnants of a synthetic polishing grit used by scientists to clean crystals. Now, I read this in the December 27th, the Daily Mail. You know, I don't normally like reading the Daily Mail, but you'll notice a lot of these articles, it's, it's almost... I don't. I don't want to shoot it down like that, but, dude, these stories happen to be true, you know. A lot of the stories that are submitted to me, I'm like truth with proof. I need to have a a, a somewhat reliable third party source, or it's just conjecture. It's just like hearsay, you know. Anyway, diamonds believed to be 4.3 billion years old were actually remnants of a synthetic polishing grit used by scientists to clean crystals. Tiny gemstones were found in cracks inside zircon crystals. Diamonds were believed to have been the Earth's oldest. New tests, new tests reveal that they were really cleaning paste used to prepare zircons. Tiny diamonds thought to be 4.3 billion years old were actually remnants of polishing grit. Left when zir zircon crystals were being prepared for laboratory testing scientists have found. The gemstones found in cracks inside the crystals were believed to have been the oldest known diamonds found in terrestrial rocks when they were first reported in the journal 2007. <clears throat> oh, can you hear me? Do I sound better? You guys are complaining about the, the vocals. Does this sound better now? <clears throat> oh, well, let's see if I turn it up. I'm going to turn it up just a little bit without clipping. There you go. Try that. Anyway, what I wanted to talk about on this is... Um, How these these diamonds, something extremely valuable, we think they're 4.3 billion years old. But where do we think that? And, and this is one of the things that we see in, in theology, the theology of the Bible. We see that um, people believe certain things. And I'm reading a book right now, I'm probably going to leave the the title out of it, but this is a famous evangelist, um, and he makes extreme leaps of logic, and I, and I verified some of the stuff that he said, and it turns out to be false. Um, I'm like, he makes flat-out statements that appear to be false, and if you don't double-check them, you're going to believe what he said. <laughs> famous pastor. With very good theology on lots of things. But on this one thing, he's just like way off, um, making, making critical mistakes, making assumptions, making bold statements that aren't true. But he's paying them as if they're true. Now, the reason we have to um, talk about this is we have to examine our own selves. Are we in the faith? Why do we believe what we believe? Number one, we cannot believe the things that we're taught just because everyone else believes it. That's the, that's the uh, popular argument. Just because everyone else believes in hyper grace or whatever doesn't mean it's true. Read the Bible for yourself. Number two, and this is this is the problem with this book that I'm reading. Just because someone claims to be an expert, or just because they have a PhD after their name, and this used to bother me. This used to really, really, really bother me. Just because someone has a PhD after their name, 
I thought, well, they know what they're talking about. And when I first, when I had my encounter with God back in 1995, I, you know, the Lord said, open your eyes, follow the instructions, or read the instructions. And um, at that point, I not only read the Bible, but I read books about the Bible, theology books. And I was extremely interested in eschatology and so forth. And people with PhDs after their name, they would make these bold claims that weren't what Scripture was saying. I'm like, well, the Scripture's not saying that. You're twisting it, you know, basically. So I thought, I'm going to continue to continue to, to read it. Uh, I'm going to continue to read them and study tremendously. And I thought, well, you know, I I might just be wrong. I'm just wrong. I don't have a Ph.D. after my name. These people know they've been to they've been through theology class and then and then after years go by someone says something in a sermon and it was this mo- moment of epiphany I had an epiphany and my spirit bore witness with what he was saying there's this there's a spirit of Christ that's in you and then there's this stuff that we believe, and we train ourselves to believe these things. Um, we train ourselves to believe things. We are fooling ourselves in false theology. That's what we do by these false assumptions. Now, they perceived that they were not learned men. Um, let's see, at 4.13. Um, now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men and marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Now, these guys were preaching the gospel. They were unlearned. They didn't know Scripture. I mean, they didn't know it from the uh, this vantage point of Gamaliel, Caiaphas, and all those guys, those top theologians of the day. But notice here that they had been with Jesus. Now, Neither did I confer with flesh or blood. That's another scripture. Galatians 1. I think it's Galatians 1. Paul did the same thing. Um, in Galatians 1. Around 11, but I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached to me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is something that Paul, he's writing to the Galatians here, but he was a ta- he sat at the feet of Gamaliel. I mean, this is one of the things I'm always talking about. And then he met Jesus in Acts chapter 9. Paul was fooling himself about his theology. He was fooling himself. He said, well, you know, Gamaliel, everybody trusts him. You know, he's got to be right. And as Paul read the Tanakh, he read all these scriptures that the other people were rejecting about the Messiah. That's why we hear the, the, the capstone, you know, the stone which the builders rejected, which should have been the apex of their theology. You know, think of a pyramid, an apex of your theology has now become the head of the corner. So um, there's no other foundation that can be laid than Christ. That's what he knows. Now, then he goes on in Galatians 1.12, for I neither received it. Now, notice it is something that we receive. The spirit of truth will guide us in all truth. Right? He received it. When this man stood up and said something in the church, he threw a football in the spirit. So I'm always tech- talking about, are you catching this? And I caught it. I don't think the people around me did. <laughs> but with me, it was a major, 
major epiphany. It changed my entire approach to theology. Not one of carnal reasoning, but one of seeking God and asking Him about it. And one of the things that we do, and you know, you know that scripture that says that we callous ourselves to the Spirit, is um, we basically shore up false doctrine because we ha- we're standing on something else. We believe it because an expert said it. We believe it because it's a popular doctrine. Those are the two big ones that I can think of right now. And we're not seeking God directly. Even if the Spirit of God is talking to us, we'll go, well, wait a minute. No, that can't be right. In Galatians 1.16, it says, To reveal his Son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Um, but he went into the spirits of Arabia, and he said that, that the Lord taught him directly. I'm trying to find that specific scripture. Yeah, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the Lord taught him. So in our Bible reading, you know, we need to know that we have a relationship with God. <laughs> and we're not following another Jesus whom we've not preached, who's, who, who's not been preached in the Bible. I'm going to play a commercial real quick because I'm about to go off on a, a different tangent here. Hear my cry, oh God, and take me back to my bed. Thank you for visiting ConradRocks.net. Conrad Rocks is supported by people just like you. If you've been blessed by Conrad Rocks, please prayerfully consider giving an offering. You can conveniently do so by using the Contribute button on the sidebar at ConradRocks.net. Regular contributors get a spot on the Conrad's Comrades page, which links back to the blog or social media of your choice. You can also help Conrad Rocks by sharing your favorite post on Facebook. Thanks again for being a part of Conrad Rocks. Remember, Jesus rules. Yeah, thank you guys for your contributions. It keeps me alive. Yeah, I have old equipment, so... More contributions would be great so I could get this audio sounding a little better. Anyway, um, what I was talking about is we're shoring up. We are BSing ourselves into our own theology in a way, and we need to brutally, brutally examine ourselves where we are in the faith. Um, and I like to do this at the end of the year. I like to ask myself, why, why do I believe the things that I believe? I believe. And Linda, as I was talking about earlier, she had put a, a link on the Conrad Rocks page. If you guys want me, to, I'll check out the stories on the Conrad Rocks Facebook page, or you can tweet them to Most Radical Men. Um, and if, if I think it's great, great for the show, I'll talk about it. Anyway, this man, he was a former Hezbollah guy. I guess I'll go ahead and put the, uh, let me put him in the, uh, the page. You've got to watch this video. I'm not going to play it for you because it's long. Anyway, this guy is speaking good English, but 18 years ago from 2012, this Hezbollah guy in Iran, you know, he he had seen, he had killed people. I mean, he's got like, he was Muslim. One of the things he says is he read the Quran in its entirety every 10 days. Now, that's pretty awesome. He prayed five days a day, five times a day. He witnessed to people in jail. For some reason, he was in prison. I don't remember what it was for. I'll have to watch it again. But if you watch this video, it's very powerful. I'll put the link in conradrocks.net. You know what? You guys need to share this video. If you have any Muslim friends, man, I would share that. So anyway... <clears throat> he's talking, and he's in this prison cell, and this guy prays. I mean, he prays a lot. 
And I started thinking, you know, there's a lot of people in the Bible that went to jail. I mean, we call Paul's epistles the prison epistles. And I'm thinking, you know, they had their needs met. They had their food, water. I mean, Paul probably has some bad circumstances, but he also had favor with the guards. They let him visit friends and stuff. But a lot of the prophets, you know, when you're in the pit like that, and I'm not getting excited about going to jail, but what I'm saying, a lot of the stuff that we read today <clears throat> is from people that were in jail. They had time to think. They had time to pray. And this guy was thinking and praying. And he said some things. He said, you know, one of the things that we don't do in the Muslim religion is we don't doubt God. We don't doubt him. Doubting is a bad sin. And I started thinking, well, you know, if their religion is wrong, they're tricking themselves. Just like Christians are on bad theology. This is the point I'm making. We are the product of our thinking. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So when we meditate... In the meditations of our heart, if we're shoring up false theology, that's because it's, we got it from a PhD. We got it from, it's the popular doctrine. It's the one on the popular television right now, the, the big network. Oh, it's got to be right. Everybody believes it. And then you believe it so much that when you, gl when you read that scripture that, that, that clearly refutes it, you don't even pay attention because your mind is calloused against the spirit and I've, I've often thought some of the you ever go back and think about the times that um that you made mistakes in high school or something and you just went you know what i could have i could have done better <laughs> there's this game that i was playing against Spur Texas. I'll never I'll never forget it. I was the cornerback, the defensive cornerback. And they had this play where the tight end looked like he was running off the sideline, right? But he was really running to the sideline to catch a trick pass. And the coach at that time, he says, I don't he said, You stay on your man. Even if he goes to the bathroom, you stay on your man. <laughs> so anyway. I was opposite to this man, this high schooler, and I was followed him to the sideline because I, I, I that's what coach told me to do. You follow him. So I found out that he was on the sideline. And then sure enough, you know, nobody expected that to happen. The quarterback throws the ball to him, and it's like this slow motion thing. This ball is coming towards my receiver and my thought was instead of intercept the ball which is what which was what I'm regretting now was just to wait till he catches it and tackle him so that's what I did I waited till he caught it and I tackled him <laughs> but now it haunts me decades later I'm like I should have jumped up caught the ball and ran for a touchdown because I was really fast you know so over the years when I look back at that I think of, it's my thought pattern. I had a faulty thought pattern. I didn't, I should have been more aggressive. And then I noticed another aspect of my life. Believe it or not, you know, as an actor and a musician and all that stuff, I had to battle with stage fright. I had serious stage fright. But I was kept being in plays and I kept being in bands and stuff like that. And what's funny is after I got out there for the first 30 seconds, it would magically disappear. So after a while... I started examining myself, brutally examining myself, and this is not about a faith thing, but faith basically has to deal with our beliefs, belief patterns. I was examining myself. What can I do? As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. What can I do with my fundamental thinking process to change so that I'm more successful? And I linked together a few things. I had a desire to do music. I had a desire to do acting. I wanted to convey stories. I wanted to convey truths to people. And I started examining the root of stage fright. Well, the root of stage fright is embarrassment. I didn't want to be embarrassed. The root of embarrassment is pride. 
It then at that I didn't really realize that pride was my problem. So I just stuck with that. I don't want to be embarrassed. Now, how do you get embarrassed? Now, see, this is brutal examination. I'm going through my thought patterns. You're embarrassed for when you make a mistake. So what I did is I practiced so much that I didn't make a mistake. I knew my part back and forth. I could play it. You know how sergeants will drill their their privates on a simulated battlefield by actually shooting the gun while they're trying to shoot a target. You know, they'll they'll you can play it under under all circumstances. So I got that down. So pretty soon I developed a false sense of confidence, which gave me pride. <laughs> so But I changed my thinking. And then I became all that, and I went into a life of sin. See, it, it's, it's, it's uh, our thought life. The battlefield, the battlefield is in the mind. We have to examine ourselves. And then we also have to make our, our thoughts. We have in the mind of Christ. The Bible says so. We have to make our thoughts, conform our thoughts to the will of God. Hi, it's Conrad from ConradRocks.net. I talk about pretty much anything from a Christian point of view. Please take the time to check out my advertisers at ConradRocks.net, and don't forget to subscribe via email. If you subscribe via email, not only will you get my updated blog posts, videos, and podcasts delivered directly to your email, you will also receive my Inner Circle newsletter, stuff I don't normally put on my blog, real Inner Circle type stuff. You deserve it because you rock. All right, so I guess my headphone, my microphone doesn't work too well. But next time I'll try my headphone mic, I guess. Anyway, speaking of of uh, stealing our mind, you know, we need to examine ourselves brutally and see if we're in the faith. And like I said, if I don't find myself having a major epiphany every six months or so, I like I need to seek God more. But what can I do? What can I do? Can I make a Bible reading plan that makes me more spiritual? No, I actually have to have the desire. And one of the ways that I do that, one of the things that I've learned, and I I pass they're not tricks, it's just something that I've learned and I like to pass it along to you is I found something in, in worship, Psalm 37, 4. This is a scripture that holds true with me. And I want to share it with you. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. So, the point there is if we worship, I find that I delight myself when I draw near to God. So when we the, the, the Lord inhabits the praises of his people, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. You can't really, you, you can try to do that with more Bible reading. You can try to do that with more prayer. You can try to do that with all sorts of stuff, but worship, sincere worship, Fasting and prayer is what he's looking for. Those who wait upon the Lord shall rise with uh, wings as eagles. In other words, you know, we need to we need to actually try to meet God. This whole thing with Peter and the apostles they they knew that they weren't learned men. Their Bible reading did not get them any anywhere, right? But their relationship with Christ, we actually need to delight ourselves in the Lord, draw near to Him spiritually, and then we learn all this stuff. We get these major revelations and epiphanies. I thought you'd like that. I wanted to share that with you. Now, another thing I wanted to read was about Watchman Ning. This guy. Now, I'm I'm reading this Pilgrim's Progress right now. Susan and I are doing it as a as a uh, devotional. <laughs> the reason I did it. It's so it supposedly sold second only to the Bible. Um, the reason we're doing it is because a lot of people say, "Oh, this book changed my life." Yes, it is a powerful book. 
but it's a milk book. It's basically, and I'm not knocking it down. I mean, if someone's recently saved and they read the Bible maybe two or three times or whatever, it's it's a good book for that level um, because it does explore fundamental doctrines. And one of the, one of the things that that I'm going to talk about that it does explore, and I've been reading it real recently, was the will for the willful ignorance of people. Um, he na- in this book. He's going to the celestial city. He's got to go through the narrow gate, the straight and narrow way, which Jesus refers to in the Sermon on the Mount. And then he's on his way to the celestial city. And on this trip, he meets all these people. He meets faithful, hopeful, and these people are named their character traits. That's what they're named. So yesterday, we read something about being willfully ignorant. And I believe that the Laodicean church, they're being willfully ignorant of the truth. Um, and I need to go to Hosea 4.6 um, to explore that. A lot of people quote the first half of the scripture, but willful ignorance is is serious. It's a serious thing. And I'm sitting here, I, I just made the statement that this book is second only to the Bible, Right. Well, the Bible is the best-selling book in history. Right now, I know, oh, what about the Dark Ages? Well, we're not in the Dark Ages right now. We have Bibles. And my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will forget thy children. So this is a serious thing. We need to... We need to... um, Aggressively seek God. He's first. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, and strength. First. And then your neighbors yourself. Well, anyway, Watchman Nee, if you read his books, you'll sit, you'll go, oh my gosh. I mean, every few sentences, you got to set the book down. Every few sentences, you got to set it down. And go, oh my gosh, that was, that was huge. So I'm going to, I'm going to have this uh, page. It's going to be on conradrocks.net. And I want you to read a little bit about this man's life. I'm going to read his martyrdom. Um, Sufferings. Let's see, I'm trying to get to the bottom here. Martyrdom. Now, it's a long page, so I'm not going to read the whole thing. But this man's books, they are huge. They're huge. They're huge, huge insights. And I'm going to read a little bit about his martyrdom. Watchman Nee was led by the Lord to remain in mainland China and to sacrifice his life for the Lord's work there. This man laid down his life for Jesus. Just like Jesus laid down his life for you and me. In this respect, he was like the Apostle Paul in Acts 20.24 who said, I consider my life of no account as if precious to myself in order that I may finish the course in the ministry which I have received from the Lord Jesus. Concerning Watchman Nee's decision, Brother Hu Sun Jin, Jin Chin, I probably mispronounced it, testified to the following. Before Brother Nee left Hong Kong, Brother Lee advised him many times not to return to the mainland. But Brother Nee said, if a mother discovered that her house was on fire and she herself was outside the house doing the laundry, what would she do? Although she realized the danger, she would not rush into the house. Although I know that my return is in fraught with dangers, I know that my many brothers and sisters are still inside. How can I not return? Now, isn't that awesome? He's going back. Just like Paul went back to Jerusalem. I don't care. I don't care if I'm killed. I'm going to go do the work of God. That's what I'm supposed to do. Watchman Nee was arrested in March 1952 because of his professed faith in Christ, as well as his leadership among the local churches. He was falsely condemned, judged, and sentenced in 1956 to 15 years of imprisonment. During this time, only his wife was allowed to visit him. Although there's no way for us to know what he experienced to the Lord during his long imprisonment, his last eight letters provide a glimpse into his suffering, feeling, and expectation during his confinement. Although prison censors did not allow him to mention the Lord's name in his letters, in his final letter, written on the day of his death, he alluded to his joy in the Lord. In my sickness, I shall still remain joyful at heart. Watchman E was practicing the word of the Apostle Paul, who said in Philippians 4.4, Rejoice in the Lord always. He died in confinement on May 30th, 1972. Humanly speaking, he died in misery and humiliation. Not one relative or brother or sister in the Lord was with him. So he was by himself. 
There was no proper notification of his death and no funeral. He was cremated on June 1st, 1972. So from 56 to 72, uh, 16 actual years in prison, I guess. Because his wife had died six months earlier, isn't that tragic? His wife had died six months earlier. Her eldest sister was informed of his death and cremation. She retrieved his ashes, which were buried alongside those of his wife in his hometown of Quanchao in the county of Hainan, Chikang province. You know I'm mispronouncing that. In May 1989, the ashes of Watchman Nee and his wife were transferred to and buried in the Christian Cemetery in Shangshan in the city of Suchow, Kyungsu province. The following is an account from Watchman Nee's, Watchman Nee's grandniece, who accompanied Mrs. Nee's sister to the labor farm to pick up his ashes. In June 1972, we got a notice from the labor farm that my granduncle had passed away. My eldest granduncle and I rushed to the labor farm, but when he got there, we learned that he'd already been cremated. We could only see his ashes. Before his departure, he left a piece of paper under his pillow, which had several lines of big words written in a shaking hand. He wanted to testify to the truth which he had even until his death. With his lifelong experience, that truth is, Christ is the Son of God who died for the redemption of sinners and resurrected after three days. This is the greatest truth in the universe. I die because of my belief in Christ. Watchman Nee, when the officer of the labor farm showed us this paper, I prayed that the Lord would let me quickly remember it by heart. My granduncle had passed away. He was faithful until death. With a crown stained with blood, he went to be with the Lord. Although God did not fulfill his last wish to come out alive to join his wife, the Lord prepared something even better. They were reunited before the Lord. During Watchman Nee's imprisonment, he was confined, but his ministry was not bound. Under the Lord's sovereignty, his ministry has spread throughout the entire world as a rich supply of life to all Christians. Now, of course, I'm thinking, except a grain of wheat, die. Uh, let me find that scripture. A grain of corn dies, I think. John twelve twenty four. And this is exemplary of, of Watchman Nee's life. And Jesus is saying in John twelve twenty three, the hours come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily I say unto you, except a corn of wheat. Let me squeeze this together so my video audience can see it. Um, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it into life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also be my servant. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I into this hour. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, when I think of Jesus, his death created many Christians. The death of the apostles, the blood of the martyrs, is the mortar of the Christian faith. Watchman Nee, his books, I'm not really sure if he writ, wrote them before prison or after. I mean, apparently he must have written them before. I can just imagine the revelation he got during prison. But his death. Look, we're reading his books. They're free. I mean, you can get all of his books free somewhere. His ultimate burden was the spread and the building up of the church as the house of God, God's tabernacle. Although his own earthly tabernacle, physical body, has been taken down, the building of God obtained through his ministry remains and still is growing and spreading throughout the earth. By the time Watchman Nee was arrested in 1952, Approximately 400 local churches has been raised up in China. In addition, over 30 local churches have been raised up in the Philippines, Singapore, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, and Indonesia. Today, there are over 2,300 local churches worldwide because of the rich and faithful ministry of Watchman Nee. So you guys, if you want some meat, I know I'm reading Pil Pilgrim's Progress right now, but Watchman Nee has some amazing 
revelations. I'm telling you, every few sentences, you'll probably put down the book and pray about it. <laughs> it's good stuff. Good stuff. Um, let's see. What else can I talk about? Let's do another commercial. And... Um Angel, demons, poltergeist, ghosts, astral projection, telepathy, telekinesis, levitation. In my book, Open Your Eyes, My Supernatural Journey, I discuss many of my supernatural experiences pre and post salvation. I discuss what it takes to see in the kingdom of heaven. Open Your Eyes, My Supernatural Journey is available on Amazon in both paperback and Kindle. All right, let's see what else we got for the news here. Speaking of, uh, there's another thing that I was uh, praying about, and I've been noticing it a lot recently um two things i don't know which one to talk about first there's lots of stuff going on right now there's lots of stuff going on right now about another jesus whom we not preached Second Corinthians eleven four. Um, for some reason, I think this is going on in the spirit right now. Second Corinthians eleven two. For I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve, and this is what I'm seeing happen a lot in the body uh, through his subtlety. So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. It's very simple. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if we receive another spirit which we have not received, or another gospel which we have not accepted, you might better, well bear with him. I've noticed a lot in my streams that people are getting intrigued with another Jesus. <clears throat> um, it's like the New Age time. The New Age Jesus, that's really big in my stream right now. Uh, and the people that, one of the things that I do is I follow Christians that, I follow people that tweet words like Holy Ghost or My Pastor Said or, you know, th I look for Christian phrases. And then I find that they can just be completely just off, way off. I mean, dropping F-bombs and stuff in their stream, it's amazing. But then I find that a lot of the people, they don't verify the Jesus that they know through Scripture. And all this New Age teaching, and I know the New Age teaching, I came out of it. I know, oh, we can say, I am Christ, just like Jesus said we do. Oh, the many will say, I am Christ, and that's what people do. You know, I am Krishna, and all <laughs> and I can do all these things, and they twist the words, and it's another Jesus, it's another gospel. I keep seeing that in my stream. I just want to make sure that you guys know two things, the Spirit and the Word agree. Number one, the Spirit, if you know Jesus... If the spirit of you know the spirit of Christ indeed dwells in you, you'll know him. And even though you're learning, you're fortifying yourself with false doctrine because of the popular argument. Um, the oh, the experts know better than me. What you're doing is there's going to be a part of your there's going to be a disparity. There's going to be a discord between your spirit, the spirit of Christ in you. There's going to be something wrong, and you'll, that question will drive you to continually seek. It's the question that drives us. You're still headed north, like if Jesus is zero degrees north. Even all these false doctrines that we're trying, we're trying to fight through them, the Spirit's talking to us. We need to be open to what the Spirit is saying. Then also, number two, not only will the Spirit, there'll be something wrong in your spirit. When you see these, this, this Jesus, this other Jesus, which is not preached in the Bible, it won't feel right. If the Spirit of Christ dwells in you, it won't, there'll be something wrong. You'll go, hmm, there'll be a check. Like a discernment, spirit of discernment. Because they're the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in you, you'll have a check. Number two, the Spirit and the Word agree. The Word, this other Jesus that people are preaching, won't be in the Word. It'll be disqualified by Scripture. So that's number one. The, the other thing... That's been that I've been dealing with in the spirit is laying aside the weight of sin. Um, I don't know why, but it's like God wants me to talk about this. Um, I may have to deal with this 
in another show on Monday. In Hebrews 12.1, it says, Where, Wherefore, seeing we are so compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, lay aside, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which doth easily beset us, and let us run the patience of the race that is set before us. Now, a lot of you in my stream, you're in ministry. There's a certain type of ministry that you have. God has a call on your life. Remember, many are called, but few are chosen. Paul likens it to a race. Now, let's imagine that you're in this called ministry, and you're disciplining yourself in the area of your call. You're finding, Through social media, you're meeting people of, of, of like minds, of like calls. You're learning, but you have the sin. Sin will slow you down. Um, there's a scripture that says, I prefer obedience rather than sacrifice. At some point, we need to just lay aside the weight of sin. Now, another thing that's very interesting is iniquity weighs. <laughs> it seems like it has weight. I'm going to tell you um, two things. Well, I'm going to tell you one. One easily. It's in my book. I was, um, I had a huge, like, heavy metal, secular, rock library. CDs, spent a lot of money. When I used to be wealthy, I had lots of, lots of CDs and movies and stuff, and and my prophetic friends, you know, like, hey, dude, you really need, you really need to burn. You can't just throw them away. Because of some scriptures in the Old Testament, you know, it needs to go through the fire. You need to burn it. You need to destroy it. Throw it away. Someone else might pick it up. And they're talking about how uh, spirits are attached to things. I mean, if you do a little bit of research, it's all over the Internet. Some of the people get these volcanic rocks from Hawaii. <laughs> all of a sudden, they have bad luck in their house. I mean, you know, I may sound like I'm going off on a tangent here, but I'm talking about the weight. Now, I'm also talking about my short-up false theology. I thought, oh, well, they're just wrong. You know, this can't be true. They're just nuts. <laughs> you know, I had this short-up false theology, and... At one point, I said, you know, there's something in my spirit, deep down in my spirit. This is true. I need to get rid of this secular, demonic type stuff. I didn't think it was demonic. I thought it was good music. So anyway, in my book, Open Your Eyes, My Supernatural Journey, it's, it's on uh, Amazon, Kindle. You can read about it. But I gathered up all my secular CDs, all my heavy metal, hard rock, all that stuff. And... I made this bonfire, or a fire pit. We had a fire pit, let's put it that way. And I burned them. <laughs> I kid you not, man. I saw <clears throat> in the spirit, or could have been with my physical eyes, man. I was seeing this. It's like the the bats were flying off these things. It's like they were leaving the CDs. And... It was, and then they were, um, they were flying in a circle above the fire, like they didn't know what to do, and, and it was like, the they were attached to the CD and the fire burning it. They had to go. They had no. They couldn't stay attached. Ninety to it seconds. Anymore. Now my head was spinning because I was attached to those things spiritually. I owned them, and it says, "Lest you become a curse like the thing like it." In Joshua, you don't want to take the accursed thing into your possession unless you become a curse like it. I was experiencing that firsthand. Now, I was dizzy. My world was changing right then and there through this act of obedience of burning this stuff. And I was lighter. <laughs> I don't know how to tell you this, man, but I was seconds. lighter. I weighed less. I weighed less. So that's that weight. That that could be the weight that he's talking about. And I went on in my Christian walk. I wasn't held back um, like I was beforehand. Anyway, I wanted to share that with you guys. Um, be sure and meet me with uh, Coffee with Conrad on Monday. I should be back. Let's see. Let me look at my calendar. Uh, yeah, I'll be back Monday. I, hopefully the 31st I'll have an interview with Marie from Spreading Joy. So be back here Monday, 730 Central Standard Time. Till we meet again, dig deeper go higher before i sign out i want to make sure that you understand who our sponsor for this month is it's holyfirejapan.com loving god with a heart for japan steve tsunami on twitter 
Uh, I put his picture up a few times in, uh, during the other commercials. He is uh, on the front lines of Japan, a Christian missionary from America in Japan. Only 1% of Japan calls themselves Christian. So he's on the front lines. Give him some, por- uh, some support over there at holyfirejapan.com. Also, he's on Twitter. Um, it is Steve Tsunami. Here's his picture. There he is, Stephen Barrett. Steve Tsunami. Give him a follow on Twitter. All right, till we meet again, dig deeper, go higher. Ten seconds.